Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Evolution of Host-Specific Virulence in an RNA Virus of Pacific Salmonid Fish. This webinar is part of the Microbiology of Virtual Week virtual event, and I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this is active, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions during the presentation. To do so, simply go to the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply click on that Ask a Box, question, uh, excuse me, Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Gail Kirath, Research Biologist, Fish Health Center at USGS Western Fisheries Research Center. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Kirath, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Okay, can you guys hear me? Uh, I think I'm on. Okay, so uh, thank you, Susie, and thank you to LabRoots. This is a pretty exciting opportunity for me because I think we can reach a lot of people with a conference like this. It's a, been a marvelous conference. So what I'm going to talk about today is a uh, host and virus um, interaction that I've been studying for a little over 20 years now. Uh, it's looking at host specificity and virulence of a virus in Pacific salmonid fish, which means salmon and trout. Now, for a lot of you, that may be an unusual set of hosts in order to consider. Uh, but for me, I live in Seattle, which is on the west coast of North America. And up here, um, Pacific salmon are extremely important. They're important for many reasons. They're a big part of the healthy ecosystem that we have. They're important economically uh, because we eat them and we rear them in culture, both in hatcheries and in farms. But they're also really important just culturally as a symbol. They're iconic for our region. So um, they have diseases and the virus I study is the most significant viral disease in Pacific salmon. So this project I'm gonna be describing is, uh, we've been doing it for three years. It has many investigators and many different institutions, as you can see in the bottom of the title slide here. Uh, so I'm presenting a synthesis uh, at three years. We still have more to go, but we've learned some really interesting things about host specificity and virulence. So uh, this is the virus, infectious hematopoietic necrosis virus, or IHNV. It's an aquatic rhabdovirus with a single-stranded RNA genome, about 11,000 bases, with six genes, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. It's originally endemic to the North American West Coast, and it has a host specificity for Pacific salmonid fish. So here's the hosts. So, in the, so IHN infects only fish in the Pacific, in the family Salmonidae. Uh, and there are many different species here. And as you can see, they've evolved um, for a long time, about 6 million years of divergence between different species within the Pacific Salmonids. We do a lot of genetic typing of the virus field isolates in, the, in these hosts. And uh, we have a database of over 3,000 field isolates, and we find that 94% of them came from one of three hosts. So these are the three dominant hosts that I'll be talking about. Oops, sorry. So these are the three uh, hosts that I'll be talking about today. Chinook salmon, sockeye salmon, and steelhead or rainbow trout. I would, make, uh, I would note that steelhead trout and rainbow trout are the same species. They're both Oncorhynchus micus. The difference is that steelhead trout migrate to the ocean and get very large. Rainbow trout stay in freshwater uh, and are the, also the um, focus of an intense aquaculture uh, industry worldwide. So although these different species diverged millions of years ago, if you look at the geographic ranges on the west coast of North America, they overlap. So this means that these species create multi-host ecosystems where the virus has an opportunity to adapt either as a specialist to one host or as a generalist to multiple hosts. And it turns out that it's done both. So it gives us an opportunity to understand natural coevolution 
and evolution of, ver of specialists and generalists in a vertebrate host. It's also important that this has an immune system very similar to m uh, mammals, and so we can understand a lot of things about the virology of generalists and specialists. In general, for my research program, we start with observing things in the field because my purpose is to understand virus populations as they occur in nature. So uh, these populations of salmonids are reared by very many fish health agencies, tribal, state, and federal, and they do surveillance for pathogens. So we have diagnostics and surveillance uh, since the 1970s. We do a lot of molecular epidemiology and we look at what's happening in the field. Things like viral emergence events, we try to understand what might be causing them. So we make hypotheses that we then test in the lab uh, and controlled studies. We do a lot of studies in vivo in living fish and also ex vivo in fish tissues. There are fish cell lines that we use and we look of course at the molecular biology and in silico. And we're studying many different aspects of this interaction between IHN virus and Pacific salmonid hosts, including pathogenesis, virulence, host specificity and immune response, uh, gene expression and viral fitness and evolution. So my talk today, this is a brief outline. First, I'm gonna give you a little overview of IHN virus and the disease impacts that it causes globally. Then we'll look at our current understanding of what we think is the evolutionary pathways that has ha have occurred in IHN to generate specialist and generalist viruses. Once we describe why we believe that those are occurring out in the field, we look at controlled wet lab studies to determine what makes a virus a specialist and what makes it a generalist. Hopefully I'll have time to describe uh, at the very end just a new project we have, which is evolution of virulence after a host jump into rainbow trout before I give some summaries. So first, the overview of IHN virus. IHNV occurs globally as one of five different geno groups. This is a very simplified tree of the glycoprotein gene phylogeny made by Rachel Breda. And you can see that there are three different geno groups, U, L, and M, that occur in North America. North America is where the virus was first detected and we believe that's where it was originally endemic. The U virus is also in Eastern Russia. The J genome group is in Asia and the E genome group is found in Europe. So the virus is pretty much in the Northern hemisphere and we understand that it's important as far as a global pathogen of fish because of the 2019 Aquatic Animal Health Code. So the OIE is the World Organization for Animal Health and they define diseases that are reportable, which means if it's detected in any member country, they have to be notified within 24 hours. In the 2019 uh, animal, Aquatic Animal Code, there are a total of 10 globally reportable fish diseases. Eight of those are caused by viruses. I just think that's interesting. And of those eight, three of them are caused by rhabdoviruses. So rhabdoviruses as a viral pathogen are really important in fish. And one of those is IHN viruses I have circled here in red. So when IHN infects fish, these are general disease signs. The first thing you is typically noticed is a rapid onset of mortality. Uh, this is an acute virus and often in culture settings, what people first see is uh, onset of mortality. And then if they look closely, they might see darkening of the skin as shown in rainbow trout in the upper uh, photo. Also exophthalmia, which is a, a bulging of the eyes, which is due to fluid imbalance, and several other uh, signs, including hemorrhage and ascites. Uh, it turns out that you can also see be behavioral changes, which include perhaps lethargy intersp interspersed with bouts of frenzy and spiral swimming or flashing. As the disease progresses, what it actually kills the fish, histopathology shows necrosis of the kidney and spleen. As far as transmission, the majority of transmission is horizontal by waterborne virus that is shed from infected fish and then is taken into naive fish either through the gills or through the skin at the bases of the fins. It's also possible to get transmission by egg associated virus as shown on the right. Those are beautiful salmon eggs. But egg associated transmission can be um, prevented in cultured fish by disinfecting the edge with a surface iodophore. So in cultured fish, the majority of transmission is horizontal. In the wild, it's both horizontal and vertical. We're fortunate in that we have good laboratory models for disease uh, infection studies of IHN in the wet lab. 
involve infecting fish. In this case, it's a group of 20 juvenile rainbow trout uh, that were infected probably a week before this photo was taken. Uh, you can see that over the, over time, you see the darkening of, of animals and the exophthalmia, and you can see some mortality. Uh, with an acute, uh, with a virulent strain, you see mortality starting at about day five, and then it continues uh, rapidly till about day 15. And you can get 80 to 90% mortality in duplicate groups. So this allows us to study this process in the wet lab. But I wanted to explain a little bit about the disease impact in the field. As far as disease significance, epidemics of IHN are rare in wild fish. They occur, but there have only been eight documented since 1973, and all were in sockeye or kokanee salmon. Those are the same, viral, uh, the same fish species, Oncorhynchus nerca, and this is one of the reasons that we think sockeye was the original ancestral host for IHN. We also see IHN epidemics in rainbow trout aquaculture. In the United States, about 80% of the rainbow trout are reared in Idaho in a very intensive culture area. And the virus emerged there in the 1970s and has been endemic and epidemic throughout that uh, area since then. Globally, we also see IHN affecting trout aquaculture in Asia and Europe. Uh, typically, epidemics occur in juvenile fish and the disease is acute and systemic and causes uh, significant losses. We also see IHN outbreaks in marine net pens in British Columbia with Atlantic salmon, uh, where they've had net, uh, epidemics, three epidemics between 1992 and 2012. This is somewhat interesting because a DNA vaccine is very effective against this virus, and it was licensed in 2005. And within this industry, it's an absolute requirement, 100% vaccination before you can put animals out into net pens. And it's a great example of really good disease control that has been very effective. Now, closest to my heart is Pacific salmon conservation hatcheries. These are hatcheries that rear many different species of Pacific salmon, including the three main uh, hosts of IHN, with the purpose of releasing them into the wild so that they can supplement wild populations that have been losing in, in uh, size due to multi multitude of uh, factors, which I, I don't have time to discuss. But so we rear these Pacific salmon, the juveniles, and then release them in these, in these hatcheries. And these are throughout California to Alaska. Um, there are literally many hundreds of hatcheries in the Pacific Northwest. IHN was first detected in these hatcheries in the 1950s, and it's been endemic or epidemic in these hatcheries in some hatcheries since then. This is what happens at a Pacific salmon conservation hatchery when you have an epidemic. Just one example of a 2009 epidemic in steelhead where over a million fish were lost, and that was 50% of the production for that hatchery for that year. So this is a, a major pathogen. So with all these disease impacts, I wanted to give you a, a synthesis of what this starts to tell us that starts to, uh, so that we can understand the virus evolution. IHN is basically in the Northern Hemisphere. And you can see the distribution of those five genogroups here with U, M, and L in North America on the left, E largely in Europe and J mostly in Asia. So if we look over time, we see that in North America on the Pacific coast, the first examples of IHN detection were in Chinook and sockeye salmon. That was before 1950. And those were in hatcheries, in hatchery epidemics. One of the U viruses uh, from sockeye were, was moved to Japan. So sockeye transported to Japan in 1991, unfortunately broke with the virus and it became established. And then it became also a pathogen in a rainbow trout aquaculture in Japan since the 1970s. This also occurred in North America where IHN developed in rainbow trout in the late 70s, and that's the M genome group. And after that, we started seeing much more IHN in rainbow trout in China in 1985, in Europe in 1987, in Korea 1991, and in central Russia in 2001. So the rainbow trout industry is, has a, a lot of IHN and other pathogens, of course, that they have to deal with. Um, the, then in 2002, we heard reports of IHN in sockeye salmon in eastern Russia. And most recently, we have an e-genogroup e virus in Iran. And I apologize for the typo, that should be 2017. I don't know why it says 1987. But so this is the disease impacts. This is what we notice. And there's a lot of description of these. And we start to look at these and it helps us to develop an understanding of the host specificity. The original viruses were in sockeye and chinook. 
But thereafter, we had an immense amount of virus in rainbow trout. This was due to a host jump. And then we also have some virus still in sockeye. So we have different specificities. These viruses are actually specific for sockeye, chinook, or rainbow trout. So if this is our understanding of the disease impacts globally, we've used this and a number of molecular epidemiology studies that have been conducted on all of these in order to develop our theory of the evolutionary pathways of IHN. And that has led to both specialist and generalist viruses. So what I'm gonna describe for you now is our overarching current theory of the evolutionary pathways of IHN. And then I'm gonna give you a little bit of the detail to explain to you why we believe that this is how it's occurred. So what we're trying to understand is how did those five different genome groups diverge globally? Well, we think the great mother IHN in the middle there was in northern region, part of North America, and it was in sockeye, and it was uh, similar to the U viruses that we see today. We know L viruses, which are common in Chinook, are also very old, and even full genome and phylogenies cannot distinguish which is ancestral. So this is probably a very, very ancient divergence of the virus. But we do know that the U virus from sockeye was the ancestor that host jumped into rainbow trout in the 1970s. And after development and establishment in the rainbow trout industry, it developed into the M genome group, which then adapted to 15 degrees, and it diverged into lots of different subgroups. So the genetic diversity in rainbow trout farms is much, much greater than it is in sockeye, in natural populations. Similarly, the U virus was transported to Japan in 1971, as I said, and that was an independent host jump into rainbow trout that led to the J genome group, which is now seen in Japan, Korea, and China. The M virus was also transported to Europe and, in, and evolved independently into the E genome group, which is specific to rainbow trout farms in Europe. We also have a, a spillback event where M virus that had evolved in rainbow trout farms spilled back into steelhead in the 1990s. And these steelhead are Pacific salmonids again that migrate to sea, to the ocean, and they're reared in conservation hatcheries. So remember that rainbow trout and steelhead are the same species. So this is not a host jump. This is just a geographic change and a spillback that got established. Lastly, and one of the big topics of today is we have evidence that the U geo group also has adapted to Chinook and Steelhead and become a subgroup, the UC. I'll be telling you that whole story. But the interesting point here is that this subgroup is not specific to Sakai as the ancestral is. The UC occurs in Chinook and Steelhead and Sakai. So this is basically a generalist subgroup, which has become very, very successful in the Columbia River Basin. So this evolutionary pattern has lots of specialization, but it also recently has generalism. So since that's going to be a main topic of the rest of my talk, I want to just uh, divert for a minute and remind us what that means. The generalist specialist concept is, is, is foundational in biology. But for viruses, when we say a specialist virus, we mean that it's adapted to continued replication and transmission in one host type, whereas a generalist virus is adapted to replication and transmission in more than one host type. There's a lot of theory developed about specialist and generalist viruses, and each has an advantage. It's basically a lifestyle choice for the virus. Specialist viruses, the hypothesized advantage, is that if you stay in the same host, you can evolve really, really high fitness in that host, and that often comes with increased virulence. However, there's a cost in that adapting really well to one host usually results in reduced fitness in other hosts, often with reduced virulence. In some environments, a generalist virus has an advantage in access to multiple hosts. So if there's not enough of one host around and you need to use more than one, you need to retain the ability to access multiple hosts. The hypothesized cost here is that when you maintain the, the fitness in multiple hosts, that constrains the fitness levels you can develop and often variance to lower levels than can be reached by specializing in a single host. So there's a lot of theory predictions here. And what we have is viruses that we think have done these naturally in the field. So this becomes a system where we can test the predictions of this theory. 
So when we're looking at what's happening in the field, we start with our database. And this has over 3,000 field isolates that we did not go get. Those were all provided by natural resource agencies that do fish health diagnostics. We genotype them, and then we look at what uh, and, and look at what they tell us. And so this basically covers, we have a pretty good picture of what IHN virus looks like in North America. And this is what's shown us for North America, the three genogroups, M, U, and L. They clearly fall out very strongly in every phylogenetic analysis and phylogenies in my work is almost always done by Rachel Breda, who is our master phylogenist shown up above. What correlates with these genogroups very strongly is host. The M is in steelhead and rainbow trout. The U is in sockeye and the L is in Chinook. But note that in each case I say mostly. That's because there are exceptions. These viruses are found in all three hosts, but the great majority of them are in one host. If we look at the spatial footprint here, this is the west coast of North America. The U virus, which is in sockeye, is in the northern part of the range, Alaska, British Columbia, and through Washington state. The L virus is in the southern part of the range in, in California. And the M is in Idaho, and it also extends down into an overlapping area with the U virus that's in the states of Washington and Oregon. So this is a lot of what IHN looks like out there, and they're apparent specialists, but they're not ab absolute. As I said, they do have rarely occur in other host species. So for many years, we thought that IHN basically evolved towards specialism, except there's one exception. And if you look right in the middle of that diagram, you can see an area where the U and M ranges overlap. That's the Columbia River Basin. And there, when we look at the viruses there, we see they're U viruses, but they're not in sockeye. They're largely in Chinook and steelhead and sockeye. And our first hint of generalism was that there's a different phenotype of host specificity just in this watershed. Um, now, there's a lot of this virus. About 30% of the adults are positive with virus for um, Chinook and Steelhead. So these two hosts, Chinook and Steelhead, also occur in the northern part of the range where U is only in sockeye, and it does not access the hosts there. It only accesses those hosts in the field in this one area. So we were very curious about this generalist phenotype. And I'm going to explain to you why we think it occurred or how we uh, how we determined that it occurred. So the question is, is U group IHN in Columbia Basin a distinct lineage? Uh, this was the research study of Allison Black. Uh, she did a master's degree with me and the diagram or the map below shows a closer view of the Columbia River Basin. This is a very large complex watershed. It's about the size of France. Uh, it covers much of the states of Washington, Oregon and Idaho. So we have coastal areas and coastal watersheds in the upper left where we have U-virus. But those U-viruses in the Columbia River Basin seem to be different. The question is, is it a distinct lineage? So Allison looked at all the genotyping we had done, which was over 1,200 isolates collected since 1971. She coded them into virus detection events to correct for sampling bias. And she found 114 U-genotypes, which were done by uh, genotyping a variable portion of the glycoprotein gene. A coalescent tree showed that indeed the viruses in the Columbia Basin are shown in orange and those in the Pacific Coast in sockeye are shown in blue. So she found that indeed it does look like the virus itself has changed. Uh, we find that the resolution of the subgroup you see is monophyletic with posterior support 0.77 and the overall evolutionary rate is typical for an RNA virus. She did look at what was driving the resolution of these two subgroups, and she found both host and geography to be significant. So at this point, we have two subgroups of the U, and we refer to the one in Pacific Coast sam uh, salmon in sockeye as UP, and that in, in Columbia River Basin we call UC, and that's the generalist in Chinook and Steelhead. She did a very interesting analysis of the ancestral state of host by and so what you see here is the two portions of that tree, the UC above and the UP below, where the branches are coded for what is the most probable host. Sockeye is in yellow, steelhead is in blue, and Chinook is red. Now remember, sockeye is what we think is the ancestral host. 
In the upper portion of the tree, the UC viruses were in sockeye originally around the 1970s, but you see a shift in the 1980s to where most of them are in blue and red, so they're in, they've shifted into steelhead and chinook. And those two hosts are interspersed throughout the rest. There's no specific lineage associated with steelhead, but it looks like the virus is transmitting back and forth between those hosts, which, confirm, which suggests a generalist phenotype. During the same period, if we look at the UP viruses in the lower portion, they stay predominantly in sockeye throughout the whole time. So we do have evolution of a generalist from a specialist, um, a specialist ancestor. Now, if we go back and look spatially, here's the Columbia Basin. And remember, it's actually an overlap of M and U viruses. So on the left, you see the M, which is the specialist for rainbow trout and steelhead. And it's in the, U, it's in the lower Columbia Basin and in the coastal watersheds. And then on the right, you see that the UC is in large, it overlaps that same region to a great extent. So this means out there in nature, in the same location, we have a specialist and generalist lineage of IHN co-occurring. It also means that in one of the hosts, which is steelhead in this region, that host has both specialist and generalist viruses infecting it. So this is pretty interesting ecology, and it led us to a matrix that helped us to design studies to, to look into it further. This is a matrix based on field prevalence. Down the left, you have the four hosts, uh, host subgroups. And so if you look at the UPs, we think by, based on field prevalence that they're specialists in sockeye. They do occur in steelhead and shuduk and rare events. So those are non-adapted hosts. The MD then is a specialist in steelhead and the other two are non-adapted hosts. Moving down, the L is a specialist in chinook and the other two hosts are non-adapted interactions. So the top three rows are our specialists one each in the dominant hosts of IHN. And then we have the UC genogroup, which is a generalist. And remember that the UP is ancestral to the MD through a host jump in the 70s, and the UP is also ancestral to UC through a shift that happened in the 1980s. And lastly, important, the UC subgroup represents natural evolution of a generalist virus from a specialist UP ancestor. And this then is my last slide on giving some concepts for what we learned from the field. And that is that specialists and generalists are not a binary phenomenon. It's a continuum in general. And basically for IHN with three different hosts, if an absolute specialist occurred, it would be found 100% of the time in only one host. That's on the left side of this continuum. On the right side of the gradient, we see an absolute generalist would be found equally in all three hosts. If we look at field prevalence, we don't see either of these absolute ends. What we see is the occurrence of di things different along the range. So just conceptually, we're thinking that the UP, MD, and L are shown on the left. And the what I'm showing you is the percent of each of those that is found in sockeye hosts versus steelhead versus Chinook. That's the three numbers. So UP, 86% of it is in sockeye, but there's some in the other two. MD, 86% is in steelhead. There's some in the other two. L, 84% of it is in Chinook, and there's some in Steelhead as well. So this is the quality of specialists we have. It's not absolute specialists, but they're pretty close to that end. Whereas the UC, we see that there's 6% in Sockeye, 32% in Steelhead, and 62% in Chinook. So much closer to the generalist end, but not actually on the end. But this is field prevalence which could be impacted by a lot of different things, including just general ecology and human activities that we may not be aware of as an influence. So what we do now is we bring this into the wet lab and test it. So we do controlled wet lab studies of specialists and generalist IHN. We're fortunate to have a, a very nice large wet lab where we can look at large populations of fish, small subgroups, replicated or individual fish in very many different infection strategies to test various traits. Our design of these wet lab studies is based on that same metric or matrix, but now we're hypothesizing what we expect to see in terms of virulence and fitness. We expect UP, MD, and L to be high fitness and virulence in each of their specialized hosts and lower in the non-adapted hosts. By theory, the UC generalist should be medium 
in each of those, but that's what we're testing in order to see if it's truly a trait of the virus host interaction rather than based on other ecological factors. The design of these wet lab experiments involves testing viruses from all four subgroups, UP, UC, MD, and L. And for each, we selected three virus strains. So we're testing 12 virus strains total. That way, if we find phenotypes, we can see whether or not they are consistent within each subgroup. And they're tested in each of the three fish hosts that are dominant for IHN. So you can see that this creates a large matrix and we're looking at many different traits. The phenotypes we tested were selected in order to cover all the possible ways that specialists in different hosts might vary. Uh, we are looking at different parts of the acute virus life cycle. So we're looking at quantifying infectious dose for each viral strain in each host. Also tissue spread and uh, in early infection, we're looking at the spread through different tissues and the host innate immune response using tr transcriptomics. We're quantifying early in-host viral replication and innate immune response during just the first two weeks. Is that where they differ? After early infection, some fish die and some survive. So we're quantifying virulence to see how that differs for these in controlled conditions. We also look at a viral shedding and transmission so that we can see whether transmission fitness is where the differences are. And we're interested in the long-term persistence in the field. So we look at the ability of these different viruses to persist out to eight months and long-term immunity. So this is basically the structure of the uh, grant that we we're just at three years in. And the questions we're asking here uh, that I'm gonna describe today, the data available is for virulence, early in-host replication and innate response and viral persistence. So that's what I'm gonna describe for you. Our overall questions are, where do the specialist, generalist and non-adapted viruses differ in each host? And where do the UP and UC viruses differ since the UP evolved into the generalist UC? So I'm gonna start with viral virulence to begin with. We look at virulence comparisons by exposing fish to each of the 12 virus strains in each of the hosts. Uh, one host is done at a time and we expose triplicate groups of 20 fish to each virus strain. And then we look at the mortality that occurs over th 30 to 60 days. Our questions are, has the generalist UC virus lost virulence in sockeye? That would be predicted by specialist generalist theory. And has it gained virulence in Chinook or sockeye? So here's what we saw in steelhead. I'm showing you here all 12 strains with three strains in each panel. The upper left is the sockeye specialists. And we see that each of them causes very similar levels between 70 and 80% mortality by 60 days after exposure. On the top right, we see the generalist strains. And here it's interesting because there were three strains, but one looked at basically high virulence and the other two were significantly lower. This was explained, we think, by the isolation years of these. The virus that still has virulence was isolated in 1975, so it was a very early UC. And the other two were from 2010, so that's more current. In order to see if a low virulence was a standard trait of current isolates, we then looked at five other UC strains from more recent years, and we found that they're all lower virulence. So the UC virus over time has lost virulence in its, in its ancestral host, which is predicted by theory. In the two bottom panels, the non-adapted MD and L strains caused almost no virulence. So if we put these together here, uh, the virulence phenotypes, this is the cumulative for the entire subgroup. So for sockeye salmon, the UP, the upper uh, curve there represents all three strains merged in the UP, and that's the specialist and it causes high virulence, whereas the generalist is much lower virulence and the non-adapted are basically very low virulence. We did the same in Chinook salmon and in steelhead, and we saw something similar and something's different. In Chinook, the L virus now causes the most mortality. So the specialist is the highest and the generalist is lower. One of the non-adapteds is low, but the other one is up at the same level of the generalist. And that is the ancestral UP. So both the UP and UC viruses are intermediate for Chinook. You see a similar pattern in steelhead where the specialist is very high causing over 80% mortality. The generalist is lower, but the ancestral UP is about the same level as the generalist. And the other non-adapted, which is the L in this case, is low. So this is our summary of what virulence looks like under controlled conditions. In each case, the specialist 
on uh, seen in the field has the highest virulence in each host. So this virus is clearly adapting toward virulence. Generalist has intermediate virulence in each host, and the non-adapted strains have low virulence in each host with an asterisk to say that in, it varies. In some cases, it's very low, and in some cases, it's moderate and similar to the uh, ancestral. So now that we have the virulence phenotypes, we can compare that with what we see in the field prevalence. You remember, this is our continuum of specialist on the left, left to generalist on the right. And if we look at what we found in virulence, it's pretty interesting. Uh, what we see here is the virulence has been um, corrected. Uh, we've assigned 100% virulence to the level of the specialist in each host, and then just recalculated how the other genotypes performed relative to the specialist. And you can see that the MD and L are quite, uh, quite strong specialists. They're still pretty close to the left-hand edge of the uh, gradient. The UP is a little closer to the middle than we thought. It is actually does have virulence in steelhead and Chinook that was not recognized. And the UC on the right now looks very clearly like a generalist in that it, it uh, has virulence in all three hosts. So this is virulence, but what underlies the virulence? Uh, could it be that it's the ability, differential abilities of the virus to replicate? So this is early replication and innate immune response. In the first two weeks, the same 12 virus strains and one host at a time we expose 40, 40 fish to each strain and then separate them out into individual beakers in this time so that they can't cross infect. So this is 540 fish in individual beakers and we harvest five from each virus strain on different sampling days shown on the right. What I'm gonna show you is the steelhead data, which we've had for the longest, although we uh, also have the data in, other, uh, in the other hosts, but I don't have time to show you everything. It's interesting in steelhead. So our questions are, do specialist, generalist, and non-adapted viruses differ in the timing or magnitude of virus replication or MX response early after infection? This was conducted by Doug McKinney and David Paez, and it's a mountain of work, so I, I need to credit them. What I'm showing you here is just the frequency of infection. In each panel, we see over time from day zero to day 14, and it's the four different subgroups. So in the lower left, I'll direct your attention to the green panels, and that is the frequency of infection of three different MD strains in steelhead. So remember, it's the specialist for steelhead. And you can see that by day one, all fish are infected, and they all fish remain in, infected out to day 14. That's not true with the other subgroups. In the upper right is our generalist. All fish are infected on day one, but thereafter, we see some clearance. And we see even more clearance in the, uh, the non-adapted strains, which is the um, blue and orange patterns, quite a bit more clearance. So they all get in, but there's a difference in how much they're cleared. Specialist is not cleared. So then for those virus, those fish that do have virus, what's the viral load look like? It tells us a bit of a similar story in that the specialist is uh, rises rapidly to, by day three and then it stays constant. Whereas the generalist and one of the non-adapteds has a similar rise to day three, but then it begins to drop. And the non-adapted L has a disadvantage, uh, doesn't even uh, reach the same peak. So for early infection, we see that it's similar uh, replication early on, but the specialists are not cleared and they have a higher viral load than the generalists and the non-adaptive strains. Importantly, we did not see a big difference between the UP and the UC here. So then we look at the MX response, which is as an indicator of the innate immune response to each of the, in each of these fish. In steelhead, I know this is very busy. So what I'm gonna uh, try to direct you to is first the left-hand panel, which is the uh, three specialist viruses. What we see is in black is the viral load and in blue is the average MX response. So it rises rapidly and then there's some diversification, but in most of the fish, it rises and stays up, which is true also for the generalist in the second panel. So as a, as a synthesis, the mean MX response is rapid, and it's pretty similar for the specialist MD and the generalist UC. On the other hand, the non-adapteds, we, we do see an MX response, but it's slower, lower, and much more variable. If you look at the variation among the uh, the blue is the virus is, uh, is the MX response in fish that are positive for virus, and the red is the MX response in the uh, fish that are negative for virus. But you see that there's a lot more variation. 
So we do see some differences, uh, interesting differences in these in these early time points of infection and MX response. And there's one very interesting thing. I'm going to drill down into the left-hand panel here. For the specialists, you see that that uh, blue line, which is the mean MX response, drops after day seven. But if you look at the individual fish, it's it's quite a dichotomy. Some are stay positive and some stay low. Remember, this is the synthesis of three strains. So if we look at those three strains, here we see that that's because two of the strains on the left have an MX response that rises with the viral load and stays high. But on the right, one of the three strains has a strong MX response, but then although the viral load stays high, the MX response is turned off. By day seven, it's being turned off, and day 10 and 15, there's no MX response. We found this really interesting because that specific strain is representative of the most dominant genotype we have in the Columbia Basin. And this genotype has displaced the other two. So it could be that the mechanism by which it displaces is that it developed the ability to turn off the host innate immune response. And we are going to be testing that by a repeat study soon. So we do see some differences early on in infection. But what about the later time points? We're very interested in long-term persistence, and these are difficult studies uh, done by Maureen Purcell and Rachel Powers. It's a lot of work. Uh, we've looked at persistence out to eight months. So for each of the hosts, Steelhead, Chinook, and Sockeye, groups of 400 to 800 fish were exposed to the specialist virus, a generalist virus, and a non-adaptive virus. We had to use a lot of fish for the specialist because we knew that there would be some mortality and we needed to be able to characterize survivors. So this is persistence in survivors. And if you look at the time points of sampling in the upper right, they were sampled early on just to tell whether or not uh, the, the, the virus had actually infected all the fish. And then at one month, three months, and eight months, larger numbers of fish were sampled in order to see whether there was differences. So the big question is, is persistence a phenotype? Does it vary among the virus strains? This is very rare to look at such a thing, but we thought it might be important in the field. This is what we saw in steelhead. Prevalence of virus is on the left and viral loads is on the right. And you can see that by either measure, all three viral strains got in uh, to most fish and uh, er at the early time points on the left, and they had about the same amount. However, over time and at the later time points, the specialist is the MD shown in red here. The specialist is in more fish at the later time points, and it has a higher viral load. So we do see, and the generalist is uh, less than the specialist, and it is not different than the non-adapted in steelhead. Slightly different story when we look in Chinook. Here we have a different amount of infection to begin with, but the, but the specialist here is the L, which is the red, and you can see that the specialist does have an advantage in both prevalence and viral load out at those lower time, uh, longer time points. The generalist virus is also less than the specialist, but by prevalence, it's higher than the non-adapted. A bit similar in the sockeye. Uh, here we have the um, specialist is the UP, and by both prevalence and viral load, there's quite an advantage in long-term persistence. Uh, but the generalist is less than the specialist, but here the generalist is definitely higher than the non-adapted. So we're seeing these specialist-generalist interactions out to eight, uh, out to long-term three and eight months. So here's my summary of what we've learned so far from the three different traits that I've, I've told you about. For virulence, specialists have the highest virulence in each host. Generalists are intermediate. And the non-adaptive are low, but the ancestral non-adapted is an intermediate level similar to the generalist. So we do have vari uh, variation in virulence. Infection frequency and early replication are similar, but the non-specialists are cleared more than the specialists. So it seems to be clearance is a very important element. Also, the innate immune, uh, the MX response is similar, but it's more uniform for specialists and generalists than for non-adapted viruses. I think that difference in uniformity is really interesting in the ability of these hosts to recognize the unadapted viruses. For persistence, the specialist viruses persisted longer at higher viral loads than generalists or non-adapted viruses. So that last quality is really interesting to us that persistence is a variable phenotype, which suggests perhaps some of this biology is driven by recovery trade-offs rather than transmission trade-offs early, uh, early in infection.
So that's basically where we are. We are going to be looking at a lot more things uh, over time. We've got the infectious dose data and the viral transmission data is looking very interesting and I hope to be able to tell you about that later. Uh, but overall, I think we have a system which is um, really telling us a lot about host specificity and how virulence in the field is determined by what happens in the actual infections, which are in controlled, st in controlled infections. That leaves me just a little time to tell you about another project, which is just now starting. I have only three slides here. But we have a new project on virulence evolution after the host jump from U to M. The principal investigator here is Andrew Wargo with an asterisk on the left. He's at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and it's a collaboration between researchers there, uh, ourselves at the uh, Western Fisheries Research Center, and, uh, and Penn Pennsylvania State. So this project basically looks, if you look at this as the North American evolution uh, pattern uh, uh, theory, it's looking at this portion. Now, the project I just detailed to you uh, looked at outside this yellow box. We looked at UP specialists, L, UC, and MD, so everything but this box. So the new project is focusing now on this box. We know that the UP viruses did a host jump into rainbow trout in the 70s. So they've had 40 or 50 years to persist in rainbow trout, and they have diverged dramatically into subgroups. So the question is, what's happened to virulence evolution during that time? This is similar to what the following the evolution of virulence in the, in the classic myxoma study in, in Australia. We're doing this by selecting a time series of IHN isolates, both U and M, across the time of the host jump. We have a large archive of IHN isolates, and you can see on the left, we've chosen two M's and two, uh, this is a time, uh, on a timeline, two M's and two U's from the 1970s, which is about when it happened. And then some from the 1990s and some more recently from the, between 2010 and 2017. This is just a start. This is our first challenges and we're testing virulence and fitness in both sockeye and rainbow trout to gather a skeleton of what has changed over time. But beyond that, then we are going to expand into looking at a much larger selection of rainbow trout viruses. So these are virus isolates from the rainbow trout industry where three different subgroups are the dominant MB, MC, and MD are dominant, and they have persisted for 40 years. So we are gonna see what happens in virulence over time. And hopefully we will learn something uh, to complement what we know about myxoma virus evolution in rabbits. So summaries then. Uh, we're very interested in IHN evolutionary pathways. And so this is a summary of what we learned from the field. We collect historical records, virus surveillance and genotyping data, we do phylogenetic analyses and molecular epidemiology. And through this, we've seen lots of interesting things happening with IHN in salmonid fish. The general rule is specialist viruses, but we've also seen host jumps, emergence events, geographic transport, and genotype displacements, which I didn't have time to talk about today, but that's been very interesting. And most recently, evolution of a generalist from a specialist ancestor. In each case then, we are looking at these in controlled wet lab experiments. And this is my summary of what we know so far. Specialist lineages of IHN virus, by several measures, we see higher fitness and virulence in each host relative to the non-specialists. So it's not based on a single trait, it's a multi-trait difference. Generalist viruses are typically intermediate by several measures, including virulence between specialist and non-adapted strains. And we do see multiple traits differ between the UP and UC viruses. So we're still in the process of trying to determine what we think actually happened to develop into the generalist virus, but uh, hopefully we'll learn that in the next year. The virulence of the generalist UC, we know it is reduced in the former sockeye salmon host, but it is not greatly increased in the new hosts. And that is, uh, the first is a prediction of specialist generalist theory. The second, I think, tells us a little bit about where it is along that gradient of specialist to generalist evolution. Both rep early replication and persistence are variable phenotypes. So with that, then, I will say thank you. Uh, on the left is the project teams. Many, many wonderful scientists have contributed to this. Our funding from the Fish and Wildlife Service, USDA, and NSF. And none of this would be possible without the wonderful collaboration of fish health management agencies. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, state fish and wildlife agencies in Washington, Idaho, Oregon, and Alaska, and uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, and the Northwest Indian Fish Commission, which runs tribal fish hatcheries in our region.
all of these people are out there on the ground and they provide us with virus isolates and they also keep us grounded in what is actually happening out there. And I think that's been really foundational for us to be able to explore these fascinating phenotypes. With that, I am done and I uh, would love to hear questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kirat, for that informative presentation. And we will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question <laughs> box located on the far left of your screen. And we already have quite a few questions that have come in. Well, good. Our first question is, <clears throat> why do you think generalist virus um, arose only in the Columbia River Basin? That's actually one of my favorite questions. Uh, when we are trying to study these phenomena and we're trying to figure out why they happened, one of the main things I'm interested in is what are humans doing that might be causing this? Because these are heavily managed systems. Not only do we rear the fish in hatcheries uh, or and fish farms, but we have dams, uh, we, we uh, have pop pollution, we have all kinds of things that is impacting the fish. And what I think uh, we, we know that the generalist only arose in the Columbia Basin, which is extremely complex. There's a lot of hatcheries. And if you look at the history, it used to be a sockeye watershed. And then in the 1950s, with the advent of hatcheries, humans are responsible for shifting the relative abundance of those three hosts. So humans have basically uh, caused more. Uh, we, we rear much more Chinook and steelhead now than sockeye. So perhaps the virus, which was originally a sockeye specialist, perceived that there uh, could not could no longer sustain itself in sockeye and it needed to shift into these other hosts. This is just a theory, but I love the theory. Uh, and I think it helps us understand what might be consequences of changing management practices in the future. So we do link this up quite a bit to, to management practices. Thank you so much. Should we be concerned with fish consumption that are host for the virus and what is the virus effect on humans if transmitted? That's a great question. Um, there is no effect at all on humans. And this is because these are cold adapted. The virus, uh, salmon are cold adapted hosts. Fish in general are cold blooded. So their viruses are adapted to the temperature of the host. The optimum temperature for this virus is 15 degrees Celsius. And it is, it is inactivated at 25 degrees C. So. As long as your body temperature is normal for a mammal at 37, that is basically too large a leap for the virus to evolve any any ability to replicate. So there's absolutely no consequence to human health. And with that also makes it a nice virus to study in the lab. Dr. Kerr, what about, can a specialist virus become a generalist virus at any point in time and vice versa? And if so, why is that? I think we have to keep in mind that continuum that, that whether a virus is a specialist or a generalist has to do with what is the most advantageous for the virus at that time. So if the conditions change, if the selection regime changes, uh, and a specialist virus is no longer advantageous, then a generalist can arise. I think that's what happened in the Columbia Basin. If you think about rainbow trout farms, there's no reason for that virus to maintain fitness in any other host because we basically present it with naive hosts of the exact same species uh, on a regular, you know, all the time. So I think it's a matter of these are lifestyle choices of the virus, um, and it depends on what's the most advantageous, like any other selected trait. It's selected by what is the most advantageous for the virus. Thank you so much. And we have some great questions coming in from our audience members. Continue to give us those questions. Thank you so much for your participation. Our next question, what would hatchery and farm observations can they tell us about the virus transmission and evolution in wild um, salmonid populations? That's another great question. Um, there's definitely virus in wild fish. It originated in wild fish. Uh, but of course, anytime you culture fish, I, I always say it's just like a grade school. Uh, you put you put young hosts at a high density, you're going to get disease transmission. So we study, we have much more surveillance of farms and hatcheries. So that's where we know a lot. But we also try to look what's in wild fish when we can. And we see the same viruses. 
you have to remember most of the hatchery populations, uh, well, all of the hatchery populations are released as juveniles and they intermingle with the wild fish. Plus water, uh, aquatic ecosystems are very interconnected with water flow. So there's really very little distinction. What we see, the main difference is that we see epidemics in fish farms and hatcheries, which we don't see very much in the wild. And that has to do with density. So. I think as uh, responsible managers, we have a responsibility to control those epidemics and make sure we don't change the virus pressure on the wild fish. But otherwise, there's not much distinction between what we see in fish uh, that are wild versus cultured. Did I answer the question there? I think you did, yeah. Okay. Um, what okay. about warming ocean waters? How will they impact the virus transmission, such as hatchery fish that migrate to the ocean? That's a great question, and there's going to be lots of differences. Uh, warming oceans is a slow process, and so we do know that the virus could can develop. It, it can uh, develop tolerance for for a higher for uh, slight changes in temperature, so it will adapt. Uh, what we know right now is that, for instance, the L virus is in the southern portion of the range in Chinook, and right now those Chinook do not migrate farther north than the northern border of California. But as, the, but as the oceans warm, we're going to see changing migration patterns in the ocean. When that happens, L virus might be brought up to the Columbia Basin. It's never been there before. So we are going to see potential for invasion because, based on changing migration patterns of the adults. So I do think ocean warming, uh, it also um, causes health impacts on the fish. It's, it's salmonids do not like warm water. So it has general health impacts. Uh, that are negative. And we had some very, very warm water uh, water years in the Columbia Basin a couple years ago, and a lot of the sockeye died on uh, migration, so they were not able to spawn. So it's gonna impact the fish for sure, and the viruses will go along with it. Oh, thank you so much. We have time for a couple more questions. Can you clarify, is the specialist, generalist, and non-adaptive technically different viruses in some sense, or are they all the same just with different actions to them? That is a really good question. I, 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 um, I'm glad that was asked because it's not the virus that is a specialist, generalist, or non-adapted. It's, and it's not the host, it's the interaction. It's gotta be this virus in this host. Is that a specialist interaction? Or is it a generalist interaction? So those terms apply to the virus and the host. In one host, a certain virus will be a specialist, but another host, it'll be a different specialist. So you really have to keep track of the fact that those terms refer to the interaction. Which pair do you have? Which virus and which, which host? In some cases, it's a specialized interaction. Some cases, it's a generalized interaction. In some cases, it's non-adapted. Good question. Thank you. Our last question that we have time for today, and this is such a great conversation. Are you hopeful for a vaccine? What do you see as a solution to the virus being in the timeline for it? What do you think? Another great question. Uh, and interesting, I worked for many years on DNA vaccines. Uh, vaccines, I think, are a really important tool, but we have to be careful. I have had people ask me, how are you going to vaccinate wild fish? I'm not going to vaccinate wild fish. I would never choose to vaccinate wild fish. It's a useful tool in culture situations in order to control epidemics. So we have a responsibility to control those epidemics, but we also have to realize that there's theory suggesting that if you vaccinate hatchery populations, you may be actually selecting for increased virulence in the pathogen in order to break through that vaccine. And since the wild fish won't be vaccinated, you could be causing a negative impact by creating viruses that are even more virulent that'll have terrible effects on the wild fish. So while we do have an effective vaccine, it's a DNA vaccine, uh, it is not easy to deliver to the thousands or millions of juvenile fish. That's why it's not widely used, but it is used in some cases, like I said, Atlantic salmon. And I do think it's a really important tool, but basically we need to learn to keep fish healthy use clean water. There are basically hygiene solutions that uh, need to be used and also management decisions. When we have an epidemic, do you call the fish or do you let the epidemic run? Those are very important management questions. Uh, the vaccine is useful in some cases. We have one already. Uh, we need the barriers delivery, delivery to small fish, but I do think that we have to be careful how we use it.
Dr. Karat, this has been a great workshop. Do you have any closing remarks for our audience before we go today? Oh, that's very fun. Um, <laughs> I, I do think it's kind of important to keep in mind uh, how useful virology of all hosts is. Uh, we tend to focus on mammalian virology and um, human virology because, of course, it's important in human health. But we can't conduct the kinds of studies that we can do in juvenile fish in humans. We can use 1,500 fish in an experiment. You can't even do that in mice. So we're trying to use the fact that they're low sentient animals to study basic virology. And um, there's a lot of beautiful work in phage, uh, in, in phage interactions uh, and infections in plants. I think, uh, I just think we need to be more synthetic in taking all of virology into account and using the strengths of each system to inform the other. That's my little soapbox. <laughs> Thank you again, Dr. Kirath, for your time today and for your important research. And before we go, I wanna thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions and questions we did not have time for today. And those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed for up to six months till March, 2021. Labrids will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you.